and gentlemen, we're finally ready to start. My name is Inshira J.C. Dente, and I am a policy and thought leadership consultant with the MasterCard Foundation. Before we get into today's panel, we're going to start off with a quick trailer um, video that we've put together of one of our youth leads, just to give a bit of you know flavor before we get into it. We also have an activity on Slido. However, I've been told that the Wi-Fi is down, so we'll be doing that manually. This will require a lot of audience engagement and participation, so I look forward to you guys being on the same page with me. So um, enjoy this quick slideshow, and we'll get started shortly. Thank you. never regretted going into agriculture. I have never regretted. The bankers are drinking my tea. The engineers are drinking my tea. The presidents are drinking my tea. My name is uh, Millicent Adoboy, Deputy CEO of Achiever Foods Limited. Achiever Foods Limited um, is an award-winning company. Um, Achiever Foods Limited is on a mission to save lives through organically grown um, turkey berry fruits um, that we process and add value to them into teas, juices, cereal mix powders, and jam spreads. The motivation and the passion to see that people eat healthy diets, eat healthy foods, the fact that we are creating jobs improving the livelihoods of people and contributing to food security and especially a shared African prosperity. That is really what keeps me moving. Daliha, save your life, love the taste. Can you hear me? Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, we don't have much Wi-Fi here, but if you're able to access the internet, please head to slido.com and we'll just run through this quick activity just to get us energized and to usher us into the conversation. So I'll give a few seconds to um, log on. If not, So just quickly, uh, our first question is, what country in Africa has the youngest population? Any guesses from the audience? Sorry? No, not Uganda. <laughs> yes, Niger. One point for this young gentleman here. <laughs> Our second question is, who is the youngest, richest person in Africa? Yes, excellent. So the answer is Mohamed Duji, who is also Tanzanian. Um, what percentage of youth in Africa are currently unemployed? Sorry? I can't hear you. 40% is the correct answer. Wow, we have a lot of smart people in the room today. Love it. What is Tanzania's largest export currently? Any guesses? We should know this since this beautiful country is hosting us currently. Tea. Sorry? I just said tea. No, unfortunately not tea. One more try. It does start with, sorry? Rice, no. Gold, we're getting closer, so it'll be precious stones. I am told Tanzanite, exactly, but not just Tanzanite, just precious stones. I'm told Tanzanite is a very beautiful gem, so maybe we'll all have a chance to see one while we're here. Okay, and our, large, and our last question is, what is the average age of an African farmer? No. N not nine. <laughs> 
39, we're getting close. 32 is the right answer. I know oftentimes we look at farmers as older, but Africa has young farmers that look like most of us in this room today. Alrighty, so as I said, my name is Inshira Jesidente, and I'm a policy consultant with the MasterCard Foundation. At, Mas at MasterCard Foundation, we believe that getting young Africans into dignified and fulfilling work is the greatest opportunity there is to transform the continent. It is impossible to unlock the full potential of the continent as, is, as it is right now, especially when looking at its economic potential without harnessing the talents of many diverse youth, which also include young women like myself. Agriculture currently is the single largest source of income for many rural Africans and also contributes to a quarter of the continent's GDP. The, con the sector occupies more than 70% of the African labor force, especially in low-income African countries, and contributes to food security and poverty reduction. As we know it, Africa is a youthful continent, but the region has by far the highest working poverty rate, which is estimated to be 40% in 2012. We all know that working is a necessity. We need to work to live, we need to work to earn, we need to earn to survive. Our growing youth population, however, doesn't see agriculture as a viable source of economic gain and as a viable source of employment. Unfortunately, it is viewed as a dead end, but that should not be the case. We see agriculture as the essential driver of economic development and an area of great opportunity, especially for young Africans. And this is precisely why the MasterCard Foundation is actively working to change this narrative by implementing initiatives that demonstrate the profitable livelihood options that agriculture can bring to young people on the continent. In this session, we'll be exploring how policymakers, decision makers, global funders can enhance young people's employment and entrepreneurship opportunities within the sector. We have our future leaders today who have been actively involved in the sector in various capacities who have developed calls to actions to each and every one of us in this room, advocating for why it is important to invest in economic opportunities for youth in agriculture. There's a copy being circulated around, so I urge you all to give it a read, review it, think on it, and identify what action you can take to move this further. Today we will hear from our youth panelists on their experiences, the good, the bad, the ugly, and they're gonna be honest with us about how we can further support them in carrying on their successes within the sector. While we're learning through the space, I urge you all to be engaged in the discussion ask thought-provoking questions, ask questions that may make you feel uncomfortable because it's in discomfort that we can grow and learn and truly transform the system. So our youth representatives today from a larger group of youth participants from the Foresight for Food workshop that was held in Mombasa, Kenya earlier this year. In Mom Foresight for Food is an international initiative that supports food systems transformations across um, continents. The workshop was also hosted by Agra, Farah, and the MasterCard Foundation. In Mom we came together, we imagined how the agri-food system can and should evolve to optimize employment opportunities. Today, our youth leaders will share with us a set of practical recommendations on their lived experiences in order to ensure that young people are not forgotten in this growing sector. So now please help me in introducing our panelists. First, we have Antoinette Molile, who is the Capacity Development Consultant for Handy Light Consultancy from Botswana. 
we also have Tao Konyamu Bakari, a public relations officer for Ghana Society for the Physically Disabled and a farmer. Harriet Chilu, our knowledge facilitator and climate advocate from Agri Engineering Network. Oduma Philip Dennis, team leader at Buzia District Farmers Association in Uganda. Induta Kimani, the co-founder of Novel Generation Limited in Kenya. Drisa Tesuge, the country representative for YPARD in Mali. And Millicent Adubwe, co-founder and deputy CEO of Achiva Foods Limited. Okay, so welcome on stage, um, my distinguished guests. So before we get into our discussion today, um, I'm just going to ask you all to just candidly share your experiences, post questions to the audience, ask them to think about what we're here to discuss. So without further ado, Antoinette, seeing as you're a policy and advocacy consultant, what can you tell us about how policies can shape our current agri-food system. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, my name is Antoinette Mulele, I'm from Botswana. I'm actually a capacity development and advocacy consultant um, for agribusiness and food systems uh, and climate change. So um, what, um, let me just share my story for you to be able to understand how I came about to where I am and what challenges I'm going through as well as um, what opportunities that have been, and even to go into the part of understanding why um, I'm here. So um, I grew up in a country called Botswana, it's in the southern part of Africa. So in my country, um, when it comes to farming, we all know that it's for older people. So finishing school, it's always been a passion to be able to make my own food, to be able to sell and make money out of it. And that alone is always a problem because we are all forced to get into a white collar job after, after school. So just that whole transition was a bit difficult for me and my peers, my friends, because no matter how much we tried, we didn't have land, we didn't have money, we couldn't be able to make much. Even if we make much of our produce, just penetrating the market itself is a problem and a half. So just that alone made us question, what is the problem? Why can't we do this? Why is it that you have to retire first to be able to succeed in the agri-food systems? And that just alone has ca um, caused me to get into the space of advocacy because one thing about me, I can talk and I can speak for myself. So what I did is um, I got to the space of trying to understand how our policy made, what are the problems, why are we struggling? I mean, where there is a problem, there is actually an opportunity in disguise just waiting for you to be able to take part of it uh, in it. So what we did um, is I got into the advocacy space. I started learning how to be able to get involved in the policies for my country. And after a few years of you know fighting and speaking for ourselves, we got to a breakthrough where we found youth ministers in the parliament um, where we got uh, subsidies for all the agricultural input, which is a yay because now it means that we can start doing something. And we also got uh, opportunities where everywhere you can sell your produces and everything, we at least have to have young people being part of that. So now looking at this from a, a wide range of um, Africa, you find that in most uh, opportunities for policy development, for strategies, laws, you mention it from the um, all these big platforms, you find that sometimes the uh, audience has more older people than younger people, which already sets a ch as a challenge because policies um, determine what happens to all of us. They determine what uh, we do and all that. And just because they are more older people in there, it means that then we do not have such great opportunities for us to be able to freely do what we need to do in our space. So that alone just made it become more of an opportunity where we go out even in the African space to be able to speak into policies, see how policies are made, and even advocate for youth inclusion, not just in brainstorming about policies, but talking, reviewing policies, implementation of policies, and all that. Because if right now you want to start into getting into the affirming space, you already have to have a challenge of 
um, produce um, inputs and all that. So just if, just in conclusion of my story, going towards the call to actions, it's all it's very vital that we have young people in the policy space and advocating for each other. And this means that when we have more of us in this kind of uh, advocacy space and policy space, then it means that we have more uh, favorable law reforms, we have subsidies, something that in my country is now even easy for us to be able to succeed. We have more procurement opportunities and there is no monopolized um, opportunities that make us to be able to at least make money and make a difference in our communities. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Antoinette, for that. As you rightfully mentioned, it is critically important for youth to be in the room when decisions are being made about things that thoroughly affect their livelihoods. And good to you for continuing to fight the good fight and advocating for all young people in agriculture. Dennis, I know that in your experience as a cross-border trade farmer, policies play a key role in how you're able to conduct your business and ensure that food is delivered to all citizens across the border. How do you do this? What can you tell us about your experiences thus far? Uh, thank you very much. I'm Oduma Philip Dennis, coming from Busia, Uganda. I'm a farmer leader and a cross-border trader. Busia is located on the eastern side of uh, Uganda and we neighbor Kenya. So when you get to Busia border, one thing you realize are the many women, many persons with disabilities, many youth who are engaged in uh, moving agricultural products from Uganda to Kenya. And then on their, way, on their return, they buy manufactured goods from uh, Kenya to Uganda. So along every border, that's how we are, we are managing to survive. That's how we are managing to support our families. And that's how we are managing to educate our children. Uh, Cross-border trade is very important, especially in the continent of Africa. You realize that uh, it has a very rich history. It goes back to the times of border trade, of butter trade. Uh, it supports a big number of uh, the population. Currently, 43% of the people in Africa are surviving on cross-border trade. Uh, it's also very important in terms of food security because it ensures that food moves from areas of plenty to areas of scarcity. For example, in West Africa, I think it accounts for 30% of the trade in staple crops. And it's also important for the integration of the communities along the borders. Because once you are trading, then you build that relationship along the borders. So, but you realize that regardless of that rich history and the, the importance of cross-border trade, the perception, especially from the governments, is still negative. It's looked at as a smuggling, tax evasion, and it's illegal. And because of that negative perception, we realize that the governments have not come in to develop policies which can ensure that cross-border trade is better and it's more supportive to the borderland communities. So. Our, our, our request is that uh, the development partners and the government should do, look at cross-border trade as an initiative which can promote employment amongst the youth, amongst the women along the borders. And currently, we, we face a number of challenges. I will talk about uh, the limited access to finance. Uh, because cross-border trade is seen as uh, illegal, we don't have any government initiatives to support it in terms of access to finance. And without finance, you are totally unable to expand, you are totally unable to uh, penetrate new markets. So the cross-border traders have remained at that level where they engage in uh, trade with small quantities of goods. Then the other challenge is, I don't know, the infrastructure. You realize that uh, most of these cross-border traders, they use 
uh, the informal routes. And the informal routes are not developed by the government, the road network. And most of these roads go through the wetlands and the swamp areas. So during the rainy period, it's very hard to access uh, the markets. Then the cross-border markets, most of them are not developed. So the cross-border traders sell in the, open, in the open places, and as a result, uh, the quality of their produce is affected by either direct sun or rain. Uh, then I'll, I'll talk about um, the non-tariff barriers. I know governments have come in and uh, they are trying to address the non-tariff barriers, but we still face a number of them, and I'll talk to only three of them. One is the, one is the limitations, limited crossing points. Uh, we only have, like, if you look at Busia, we only have one crossing point. Uh, the mandate is that you have to go through the crossing point. And between uh, the crossing point, between the custom and the Majanj in the south, it's around 25 kilometers. So along all that stretch, there are cross-border traders. And if you mandate them that they only have to use the customs, it's very expensive, it's very time-consuming. Because literally, like, Muhu is staying 10 kilometers, I have to travel 10 kilometers to custom, then 10 kilometers into Kenya. And yet I would just cross directly. So we would request that uh, governments come in to ensure that the crossing points we have are made more effective, they are supported, and we can uh, use them especially for the, for the small-scale farm traders. So our call is to action. Uh, one is that governments should develop policies which will ensure that uh, cross-border traders can operate uh, without any disturbances. They can operate safely and they support the economy of the borderland communities. Uh, then government and the private sector investors should establish trade houses along the continent such that we can build the market linkages between uh, the cross-border traders and the, the bigger markets created by the African continental free trade area. And lastly, uh, we should invest in uh, trade and market infrastructure to enable that the cross-border traders can easily access the markets and while in the markets, they can uh, operate safely. Together we can act now and we ensure that we regenerate cross-border trade and the borderland communities benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis, for sharing that. You know, most of the time, we actually don't think about where our food comes from. I know I certainly forget to do so. There are so many groups, so many regions that are underserved, underdeveloped, that are falling through the cracks, and this just shouldn't be the case. Everyone, regardless of where you're in a rural area or a city or an urban center, should have access to the resources that they require for a strong livelihood. Thank you for sharing that. In Duta, in your experience as a young female entrepreneur in agriculture, has it been great? Has it been bad? What have you learned? What can you share with us today? Uh, thank you, Inshira. My name, as mentioned, is Nduta Kimani. I am the co-founder of Novel Generations Limited, based in Kenya. I currently consult in agribusiness management, design, and and across the value chain in market linkages. So in my experience, 43% of women in agriculture serve the global workforce, but these are the most underserved communities uh, facing challenges of discrimination, inequality in pay, lack of access to technology and lands. We have also noticed over the last couple of years, there's been a significant decline in enrollment of youth in agriculture. We look at youth as our, as our future and we all have to eat every other day. So seeing this happen gives us a look into the future and changes need to be made because this needs to be revised. 
we are not going to be able to feed ourselves if the youth are not going to participate in this very key activity. Having been a consultant and worked in various farms, I've been able to fall in love with agriculture despite the many heartbreaks that she has given me. Climate change and everything happening right now has forced us to be very creative in how we practice agriculture and we look forward to continuing to do this more. So imagine a scenario when I was quitting my corporate job and I'm letting my parents know that I no longer want to do this. An African parent, my African parents looked at me like I was crazy. They were thinking, you're throwing away your future to go into agriculture. Because this is something they saw as not really a way to earn a respectable living. So it became very discouraging for me to really venture out into this, but I was really strong in what I wanted, and I still went for it. I set up my first farm, farm in Kajiado County, the, in Kenya, the heart of the famous Maasai people who are very rich in culture, but also a patriarchal society that is nomadic as well. So looking at this young lady setting up operations here, was also a bit of a challenge. During community meetings, they mumble behind my back that this is not a place for women to do this kind of work in this community. But I still pushed forward, and as soon as they saw my operation was running well, I can clearly say they changed their minds, and currently I run different uh, training sessions with my farm community. We aggregate our crops together and take to the local market. So. What I can say is that I'd love to see more farmers that look like me, farmers who are youth, farmers who are women, pushing the agenda of agriculture and teaching it to different communities who never thought it possible. So my call to action is through the education system. We really need to consider how we present agriculture to our young kids in the education system. It needs to be something that cuts across from primary school all the way to the tertiary education. We need to have more media looking at, we need to look at more pictures that depict farmers as a career that we would want to get into. Uh, we need to look at business development and look at incubation programs where the youth are able to be supported in their startups and how to grow. So we look to the government and the leaders that are in this room to better support the youth to find a way to create a better future for all of us. So I will conclude uh, with an African proverb. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, but the second best time is right now. So let's act, regenerate, and recover. Thank you. Thank you very much, Induta. You know, as women, we face so many barriers, and I can imagine that as young women in Africa, it's not easy. I want to challenge our male allies in the room. What can you do to support young females in agriculture and beyond? And as the greatest of all time, Beyonce said, who runs the world? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, Fatal, our resident farmer, what can you tell us about your experiences advocating for not just the physically disabled, but also farmers in rural areas? Thank you very much. I feel, I feel standing when I, whenever I talk, so I'll prefer standing. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Bakari K. Fatao. I'm a public relations officer for persons living with disability. That is the Ghana Society for the Physically Disabled. West Gonja District, and I'm an advocate for Disabled Farmers Union. Uh, I've been a farmer since 2019, myself. Uh, I'm from a polygamous family. So, and starting uh, farm, uh, farming as uh, a person with disability, it wasn't easy at all. So, access to finance was my problem and the rest. So. When I venture into farming, I got the opportunity to attend a workshop on farm management and farming as a business. 
that was uh, organized by the Pharma Business School in collaboration with GIZ. So I got inside knowledge about uh, farming. So I tried to capitalize on the land I inherited from my late father to start up a farm. But starting up a farm is not just by the land. You start with plowing and the rest. So I tried to assess loans to start a farm. I went to Vision Farm uh, Financial Services, a bank established by the World Vision International to assess loan. But they, they wouldn't risk giving their money to me because I'm a first time farmer too. I'm a person living with disability. And in the community I come from, they see disability as a curse, the stigma. So they see it to be a waste of time. A person with disability, you go into farming and run at a loss. How do you chase you for our money? Even though I offer to give land documents as collateral, but they wouldn't give in. So I couldn't assess the loan. I heard about government flagship program, planting for food and jobs. Then I tried to use the opportunity. I went there and the whole system was politicized. So I couldn't get any support from there. So I had to gather the little I have with this support from my family members. I hired a tra uh, the services of a tractor. Even though there was a tractor that you, you pay cheaper, then you get, uh, you, they go and plow for you. But they wouldn't go and plow for me because they, they don't want to waste their energy on a disabled farmer's farm so that maybe you will leave the crops then run away. <laughs> so the family supported me. I hired the services of a tractor. I plow. First, I started with two acres of granite because granite does not require uh, fertilizers. So it was easy if you take care of it very well, then it's easy for you to get, get better yield. So I harvested granite, sold the granite, then used them to buy fertilizers for maize. So that is how I've been a farmer till now. And this, I, uh, a colleague, person with disability, shared the experience when she told me that farming is no more attractive to her because she has been a farmer for long. But especially this year, farming is not attractive to her in the sense that cost of inputs, farming input is very high. Somebody on a wheelchair is able to uh, farm about 30 acres of maize, but fertilizers to apply is a problem. So access to finance is a very difficult issue than the, than, that the youth, not only disabled youth, the youth are facing. So uh, policy implementers, I urge you uh, and civil society organizations to organize to organize innovative trainings so that to educate financial institutions for the need to bring persons, uh, the youth who are, to support the youth with, let's say, loans, uh, agri loans to start up farming so that it will be attractive to them. And I plead on the politicians, please, the flagship programs that will help shape the future of the youth, please don't politicize them. Let us get access to those things and it will shape our futures. And I'm also uh, pleading on the policy implementers. Why not subsidize the farming inputs for the youth? When farming inputs are there and you're a youth, they give you some quota. They subsidize it for you so that you'll be able to, to farm. That makes farming attractive to the youth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fatal, for sharing your experiences. You know, as I'm listening to all of you speak, here we are with a strong panel of youth experts, youth leaders who are interested and invested in the agriculture sector, who represent various um, opportunities across the value chain. And what are, they mean, uh, what are they currently facing? Access to finance issues. If it's not access to finance, it's the patriarchy. If it's not the patriarchy, it's policies that don't include them and criminalize their activities. Here we are. This is our future. What can be done to ensure that this narrative changes and the current practices change to include youth in our development policies as we try to expand the sector? Thank you very much for sharing, Fatal.
You know, one topic that we haven't touched on yet is climate. And if we don't have a climate smart environment, we're not going to eat. Harriet, as a knowledge facilitator and climate expert, what can you share with us? How can policies and current practices include youth and also make sure that Africa is ready? Thank you very much, Nia. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm glad and humbled to be presenting the youth on this panel. I come from a rural community where agriculture is our main source of livelihood, with over 60% of the population dependent on agriculture, and 95% of it really depending on rain-fed farming and the environment to produce, right? With that being said, um, climate change really does threaten our food security in these communities and definitely is a very big discouragement to young people because the cost of loss and damage alone is enough to just let youths not want to even participate in agriculture-related activities. Uh, unfortunately, this year wasn't a good year for us as well because I myself had faced losses that came with um, flooding in my area and in my community. Um, so uh, our, our communities right now are definitely facing many challenges, but one uh, most important one, as you have mentioned, is climate change because it definitely threatens uh, our poverty reduction goals and also ensuring that our communities are food secure. Um, and one limiting factor, unfortunately, is capacity building in these communities and uh, um, our curriculum is, as well. So today I'm here to just uh, advocate for climate inclusion in our curriculum, like my colleagues Nduta and my other colleagues mentioned earlier, that we need to reform uh, the education system to ensure that we are including everything that is related to climate in the curriculum for youth to have the capacity and skills to also prepare themselves to venture into these activities and also be able to be climate resilient, to adapt and also mean to get the effects of climate change. So my focus will be on, uh, on three things. Uh, the first one being we must recognize the immense value of indigenous knowledge in our communities and do an inclusive and holistic approach into ensuring that our, com our, our curriculum is includes, including the traditional knowledge that is in these communities with educators, researchers, and all those that are involved in education and capacity building to ensure that the curriculum speaks to the needs of each community where youths are, are based. Secondly, uh, we advocate for climate action through agro-innovation. We, we are encouraging um, education institutions and climate organizations to come together and make a climate resilience hub. This will not only ensure that uh, young people have access to all the information, weather updates, whatever it is they need to be proactive in the agriculture sector, but it will also allow them to co-create with others and ensure that we're coming up with uh, environmentally friendly agripreneurs in the future. And thirdly, um, empowering students to become catalysts of community-led climate adaptation is very important because most of the times we focus uh, things outside the communities. This should be community-centered. Whenever we go into researching and doing things that are related to communities, we need to ensure that whatever information we're delivering to communities speak to the uh, climatic challenges that they're facing in those communities and address them. And uh, encouraging youth to be part of such programs would definitely help them in ensuring that we have a sustainable food system. In conclusion, really, uh, taking a holistic approach into research, including and involving youth in each and every step of the way, the local farmers, all the forgotten farmers, will give us a more realistic research that is action-oriented to address the specific needs of each community. And together we can recover, regenerate, and act and ensure that we have a food system that is sustainable and is able to speak to the needs of the African continent. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Harriet, and thank you for delivering that very important message. So what I'm hearing we need policy improvements, policy advancements that not only implement changes within the sector, but also contribute to shifting the mindset. I'm sure most of you would not have believed in Duta if she told you she was a farmer. And I'm sure we all know from our earlier quiz that farmers can look like any one of us in this room. So it's critically important that we shift our mindset when it comes to how we view the system, how we view the climates, to be able to ensure that we do, in fact, have a sustainable food system. You spoke a lot about research and education. And Dresa, I know this is your area of expertise. How can existing research that is conducted in Africa contributes to ensuring that there are systems and solutions in place that advance employment opportunities within the sector. L'éducation est l'arme la plus puissante au monde. Qui nous disait ça? Je pose la question à l'audience, s'il vous plaît. L'éducation est l'arme la plus puissante au monde. Qui nous a fait sortir ce proverbe Pas de volontaires pour y répondre Teresa, does anyone speak French, please Noel, can you please help Teresa in um, delivering the message? So the question was, how can existing research and education on the continent contribute? Teresa, take us away. Okay. <laughs> Et nous vous présentons des excuses pour ces désagréments causés. J'avais posé la question de savoir l'éducation est l'arme la plus puissante au monde. Qui était l'auteur On m'a bien répondu que c'est le président fait Nelson Mandela. Nous savons tous le rôle de l'éducation. Ce proverbe nous détermine à quel point l'éducation doit être importante dans notre continent du continent africain. Et si nous regardons bien, le système éducatif actuel que nous disposons répond-il répond plutôt aux besoins du continent Je dirais non. L'Afrique est le continent qui a le plus de terres arables au monde, mais l'Afrique est nourrie par d'autres personnes, par d'autres continents. Est-ce que est -ce, ce dont l'Afrique a besoin pour se développer ou bien de répondre maintenant à ses propres besoins. Je n'en pense pas. La jeunesse, on dit que l'Afrique a la population la plus jeune au monde, mais cependant, l'Afrique aussi a, la population, a une population jeune le moins instruite au monde. Donc, comment pallier ces problèmes et comment pouvoir mettre en place un système qui donne des opportunités à la jeunesse qui demande d'opportunités Et cette opportunité peut peut se trouver au niveau de l'agriculture. Et cette agriculture dont on ne nous parle jamais à l'école, sauf ceux qui sont issus d'une famille d'agriculteurs. Et nous savons tous que beaucoup ne sont pas issus de familles d'agriculteurs. Et ceux qui sont issus de familles d'agriculteurs ont parfois honte d'entreprendre dans ce domaine-là, parce qu'ils se disent, non, j'ai été à l'école des Blancs, il faut que je travaille ailleurs. Mais permettez-moi de vous présenter qui je suis. Moi, je suis Drissa Tessouguet. Je suis détenteur d'un master en sécurité alimentaire et nutrition. Et aussi, j'ai une maîtrise en géographie, aménagement et environnement. Donc, je suis issu d'une famille d'agriculteurs dont mon père aussi est un entrepreneur aguerri dans le domaine de la vente des produits agricoles. Car il vend des piments, de la tomate, des choux-pommes, etc. Donc, ayant grandi dans cet environnement, quelle autre filière dois-je embrasser à part l'agriculture Je ne vois d'autre. Je me suis ainsi intéressé à, ce, à, ce, à cette filière qui doit beaucoup apporter à l'Afrique. Donc à travers ceci, j'ai pu acquérir des compétences à travers un cursus éducatif qui m'a permis de comprendre ce que c'est que l'agriculture, chose que beaucoup de jeunes n'ont pas eu à apprendre parce qu'ils n'ont pas voulu embrasser ces volets-là. Pourquoi Parce que c'est une honte pour eux de les voir avec l'odeur de la boue alors que c'est une nécessité pour pouvoir répondre aux besoins de l'Afrique. Nous en avons tant besoin et nous allons le faire ensemble. C'est à, à ce niveau que je lance un appel au niveau des dirigeants afin de 
afin d'adopter un système éducatif avec une réforme incluant une valorisation totale du domaine agricole et de l'entrepreneuriat agricole des jeunes. À travers un système qui ne se focalisera pas seulement sur la théorie, mais qui apportera de la pratique, parce qu'il faut de la pratique pour comprendre ce que c'est que l'agriculture. On ne peut pas rester dans un bureau ou bien dans une école pour parler de l'agriculture. Il faut aller sur le terrain, étudier l'environnement, étudier les sols, comprendre les, les besoins des sols, comprendre le fonctionnement du sol et pouvoir donner au sol ce que le sol veut et en tirer profit de ce qu'on avait donné. Parce qu'on dit, l'adage nous dit généralement que l'on récolte ce qu'on a semé. Et si nous n'avons pas semé, qu'est-ce que nous allons récolter Le système éducatif actuel pousse la jeunesse à aller vers le chômage et non pas leur donner l'opportunité d'acquérir des compétences entrepreneuriales afin de développer le secteur agroalimentaire en général. Pour cela, un cursus éducatif mettant un point essentiel sur l'évolution, un, un point essentiel sur l'agriculture et l'entrepreneuriat des jeunes est tout à fait nécessaire. Après cela, il faut aussi essayer d'apporter un développement des compétences au niveau des jeunes qui ont déjà... La, qui ont déjà de l'âge avancé parce qu'ils ont aussi besoin d'avoir des compétences supplémentaires pour, pour pouvoir se rediriger dans le secteur de l'agriculture. Cette redirection nécessite des centres de formation ou bien des centres de développement des compétences et de renforcement des capacités de ceux qui sont déjà formés à travers des EB, à travers des EB qui vont essayer de venir pallier les jeunes, les suivre. Car nous savons tous que la jeunesse actuelle L'entrepreneuriat auquel les jeunes sont appelés, euh, appelés aujourd'hui est très limité. Et ceux qui, font, ceux qui parviennent à créer leur entreprise sont parfois limités parce que seulement 10 à 20 des entreprises créées par les jeunes atteignent la maturité. Et c'est vraiment très grave. Comment, comme, quelle solution doit-on chercher pour maintenant limiter cette casse-là Nous savons tous que le gouvernement... Les institutions éducatives, les leaders, ainsi que l'ensemble de la population, que ce soit agriculteurs, politiciens ou autres, nous sommes tous appelés à venir à l'aide à cette filière-là, à ce domaine d'activité, l'agriculture, qui doit nourrir l'Afrique et dont l'Afrique doit nourrir les autres aussi. Nous ne, nous ne devons pas nous dépendre des autres, mais nous voulons, que, nous, voulons nous assumer, assumer la sécurité alimentaire et nutritionnelle de l'ensemble de l'Afrique. Pour cela... Je vous remercie, monsieur. Thank you very much, uh, Drisa, or rather, merci, Drisa. And, um, you know, it's very interesting how agriculture is not an expected discipline in school. And it's very interesting how you mentioned that the reason why you're in it is because you come from a farm background. That shouldn't be the case. So thank you for reminding us of why it is important for it to be embedded within our curriculum from young age so that it can be recognized as the dignified form of employment that it is. Okay, so we're coming to a conclusion soon, but, and I know we're over time and I know we're probably hungry, but bear with us, we have more gems to drop. Millicent, what can you tell us about your experience as a young woman in agriculture when it comes to trade? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Inshira. My name is Millicent Adoboy, co-founder and deputy CEO of Achiva Foods Limited, a food scientist and a Generation Africa Impact Award winner. I have a question for everyone here. Is there anyone here who has ever gone to bed hungry? Please, can I see a hand? You've gone to bed hungry. Oh, thank you. How was your dreams? Did you have a good dream? <laughs> Knowing that you were hungry? It was very bad, right? <laughs> That's so real. I was born amidst the 1994 civil war in the northern part of Ghana. Assessing healthy, nutritious food was difficult. 
Many times we went to bed hungry. Few years later, in 2016, I almost died due to iron deficiency anemia, a malnutrition disease that causes millions of deaths in Africa. In fact, it compelled me to quit my job. During this trauma, we discovered a nutrient-dense climate-adaptive crop locally called Abedru in Ghana, and the English name is Teki Berries. This crop helped improve my nutrition and saved my life. In 2018, after a series of research into the plants which saved my life, I started Achiever Foods Limited, an agribusiness with my husband, adding value to this crop to improve nutrition and food security. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are partnering with over 50 smallholder women farmers to grow the turkey berries to feed our factory. Uh, the video footage that was shown was just an opposite of what we do in our factory. And these women grow the fruits. We create a ready market for them. We reduce their post-harvest losses and increase their income levels. We have been able to add value to these turkey berry crops into 22 lines of products ranging from teas, I brought a sample of the tea here today. Cereal mix powders, jam spreads, and juices. We have also been able to employ 16 youth in our mini factory, making a total of 66 jobs that we have created in the agri-food systems. And a notable award that we won was given to us by Generation Africa in 2020 uh, which was an impact award for helping to improve the nutrition of over 400 pregnant women in Ghana who would have lost their lives. Despite these great contributions in the agri-food sector, ladies and gentlemen, we still face challenges assessing funding for agriculture inputs, acquiring lands and machinery to increase our production and productivity. There is inadequate market and trade information to enable us to find buyers um, to export our products to many sub-Saharan African countries where malnutrition is prevalent. The trade service providers' rates do not favor the transportation of our farm produce and finished products. In the midst of all this, it will interest you to know that it was much easier responding to purchase orders from African stores in the United States of America and not Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa is still a net importer of agricultural products. We spend over $50 billion annually on food imports. Access to trade will play a critical role in shaping the agri-food systems. But yet, majority of farmers, women, youth are faced with inadequate infrastructure, lack of access to modern technologies, and funding. Today, we want to call on development partners, governments, private sector organizations, financial and research institutions to promote to promote equitable financial inclusions through public-private partnership for diverse climate-resilient financial packages, such as de-risking agriculture, favorable insurance products, um, microfinance models to support women and youth agribusinesses. We also advocate for adherence to the Malabo Declaration of 10% budgetary funds allocation to agriculture, infrastructure, and value chain development. It will interest you to know that as of today, less than 15 countries within the African continent have agreed to this declaration. We also want to call for investments in improved markets and trade information to enable value chain integration and access to premium markets. And we are looking at this from the local level, the regional level, and the national level. 
We also advocate for policies that will encourage trade service providers to provide subsidized rates for youth um, agribusinesses, and most importantly, strengthen youth networks to drive demand for lower cost of trade through economics of scale. We also want to advocate for policies, youth-centered policies, that promotes um, a certification and a regulatory system to promote environmental responsibility and sustainability while assessing uh, premium markets. One of the challenges that is going to uh, be facing intra-Africa trade is how we can ensure that agribusinesses are environmentally responsible. Recently, one African country banned the imports of plastic packaged products. That was a step in the right direction, but it will not favor the youth. Do you know why? Mostly, when we start, we don't have enough funding to invest in premium, eco-friendly packages. So we use the plastic products. So what it means is that if governments are banning the imports of plastic packages, then they have to invest in the youth's ability to acquire eco-friendly packages. We also call for policies that would uh, protect the intellectual property rights of the youth. Invest in the innovative ideas of the youth is great. We need to protect our ideas so that they are not exploited by countries that have economics of scale. Finally, women make up more than 60% of the agricultural labor force. And we need to promote youth and women participation in the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement because um, the Free Continental Trade Agreement um, has been estimated to, to, to be able to boost regional trade and reduce the continent's trade deficits. And how do we promote women and youth participation in the trade agreement? We can do this through stock-taking programs where we monitor trade among young women and also an initiative like the AFC FTA Trade Fair and, and Awards where we recognize the success trade stories that these young uh, people are churning in promoting intra-Africa trade. Ladies and gentlemen, through commitments, collaborations, partnerships, Africa's rapidly growing youth population will be able to realize its potential to secure food, create decent jobs and sustainable livelihoods, boost economic growth, and a shared African prosperity. We, the youth seated here and the many other youth we represent, will continue to be agents of change and will inspire other youth to be engaged in the agri-food systems. The time is now to embrace the power of the African youth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Millicent. Thank you. Now, you've heard from us, young people, what we hope for and what we expect to see within the sector. We'll take a few questions from the audience at this time. So please. Please just identify yourself if you have um, a question for any of our panelists. Thank you. So um, maybe any, any, any of, um, of the panelists can answer this. Um, so you know, while all the panelists were talking, thank you all for your nice talks. Um, it's, it kind of clicked to my mind like, you know, um, if we are talking about um, how to enhance young people's employment and entrepreneurship opportunity, in Africa's Af uh, agri-food systems, then we, we really need to see how does all of this fits into youths who um, really wanna go and work into agriculture, but instead they won't go out there and farm, they won't go there and you know make produce, but still maybe they will create infrastructures to enable farming. They will create um, these, they will come up with these innov innovative solutions to facilitate um, agriculture in, you know, across the value chains. Now, how does this youth um, present himself 
for him or rather you know to 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 come across different you know to tackle all these challenges that you have mentioned finances policies and better to make it you know most of the innovations that we have as youths may sound as research ideas rather than business uh, viable business opportunities at first now how does uh, an innovative youth regardless of uh, the idea that he or she has, how can they present themselves into, a, like this is a business, a viable business idea rather than a research project? Mm. Thank you very much for your question. Antoinette, in your experience as a capacity development um, advocate, how can we advocate for ourselves as young people with viable business, uh, viable business solutions? Okay, um, thank you for that question. Um, as you are asking the question, I remember that we are actually talking about agri-food systems and not farming. And it's a very good question because in most cases when we hear agribusiness or food systems, the first thing we think of is farmers. The fact of the matter is all of us are expected or actually have a role to play. It's a whole right, right range of business, whatever, if you may call it business or food systems. You see, a systems means a collaboration of so many entities from digital technology to marketing to farming. I, when I gave my speech, I never mentioned that I'm a farmer, but I am a farmer. In fact, I talked more about my capacity development and advocacy consultancy because that alone plays a huge role in the whole food systems, which means that the most important thing, even when we talk about youth inclusion, is to make sure that you quite remember and you are well aware that you have a role to play. And when you don't play your role, you are affecting the whole system. It's like a ripple effect. If I'm constantly farming, but there's no one helping me with the market, then it means somehow I'm gonna struggle with my produce. Now going to the next question of just beyond just that and how we can position yourself. I hope that's what you were trying to ask. That's where we are. And it's important to note that even when all of us were talking, we mentioned hackathons, competitions, and all that. We're basically trying to come up with solutions that we can entertain as ourselves as the youth and also as everyone, whether you're a decision maker, whether you're one. And you have to remember, all of us are policy makers, one way or the other. When you do, don't do your part, somebody does it for you, meaning you are left behind. We all have a role to play, and we can actually do that as long as we could remember it. agriculture does not mean a farmer only. It means all of us, including a consumer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoinette. Induta? I just wanted to add on to that. There is a function by Agra tomorrow for go-getters. So this is like an incubation or hackathon where the youth and anyone is able to present their idea in tech or any other industry across the value chain of ag to get funding. So there's a few things that are on the market right now for youth to enter agriculture in different ways other than just production. Thank you. Right, I, I'd like to stand like uh, my brother Fatao from Ghana. So my <laughs> name is Benjamin, I'm from Ghana and um, MasterCard Foundation partner with Cosmos Innovation Center. And listening to all the conversations by our beautiful panelists um, this, uh, today, I now understand why the foundation decided to even invest or support programs like Cosmos Innovation Center. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the questions that, question that um, um, Dresa asked about education and the kind of education that we get that supports us to do the things that is right for Africa, the things that will let us also grow. I do not know any of uh, where you're all coming from, but in Ghana, agriculture has been taken off the curriculum. Mm. And so unless you're studying core agriculture, uh, you, elective agriculture, you don't even get to study at the junior high, the senior high, and that is something that is not making people, young people feel like it is an attractive space. But through the partnership with the foundation, now we have created what we, uh, there's a program that we're supporting called a school farm competition. Yes, I, no, it's just a contribution to say that 
There are other programs, and just to respond, there are programs that um, I, want, I would ask the foundation to see how you can duplicate these programs across the continent to allow young people to have opportunity to do proper market research to understand how agribusiness or how my business can really, really go on. And we have created this program. I'm happy to share more about what we do and how we can also partner any other country, anybody uh, organization that they can also replicate because we want to grow across the continent to support the youth in agriculture. Our incubation focuses mainly on agriculture, mainly on the youth. And um, we are partnering about 10 universities now there's quite a lot to say, and I know we have to go, but um, just check out Cosmos Innovation Center. I'm happy to have a conversation with you and how we can also grow. And thank you, the foundation. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate all your contributions, but let's please keep this to just questions for our panelists. Thank you. Finot? Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for your really, really interesting um, uh, discussion. My name is Wamboi Chege and I'm from the MasterCard Foundation. So I have two questions to Millicent and to Nduta. Um, as in your journey as entrepreneurs and in the fields where you are, how did you, how did you start? Like where did you get the capital to make your investments? How have you grown your businesses? Um, and and then where do you see yourself in five years and what would it take to get there? Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Aaron. I'm also from Ghana. Mine is also not a question but a contribution. I think it goes to the foundation and to all of um, our beautiful panelists up there. Working in the agribusiness space for quite a long time, my observation has been that every participant, every stakeholder in it, especially the youth, everybody wants to work on their own, individuals. I do my part, he does his part, I own my business, she owns her business. What I think going forward, the foundation and other stakeholders can promote is partnerships. I know that, you know, Businesses, especially in Africa, I will be specific Ghana because I know that more, do not like to partner, you know, if I have my idea, I have my capital, I have my knowledge, I want to run my own business. But I think that it is better to own 10% in a $10 million project, like business, the 100% in $100,000 um, project. That type of partnership. You are an aggregator. I am an aggregator. You are a producer. You are a trans. You know. You are a trader. You are a transformer. How do we bring these small organizations together so that they can scale up the number of customers they can supply? They will be more attractive to funders, to banks, and then they will be able to invest in things like research and development, such that their growth will be organic, and then they themselves will be able to take it to the next level. That is what I want to say. Thanks. Thank you very much for your contribution. I'm just going to give Antoinette and Induta to address uh, Wamboy's question, which was, how did you get your initial investment, and where do you see yourself in five years? Oh, Millicent, sorry. Oh, thank you so much. So I actually started a personal savings uh, in Ghana I would say 400 Ghana CD, that's like about $35. That is what I used um, to research in the techyberry fruits. And then that is how I started. But then in getting it into the finished product, um, I had to seek for funding from family and friends. Um, I called one uh, family member in the US and then he supported me with um, some thousand dollars. But the challenge was most of the financial institutions were not ready to invest in our business. One, they told us the agriculture sector is a high risk sector and um, investing in that sector was not too certain, so they were not interested. And so every funding opportunity that we I uh, wanted to take advantage of, 
really did not favor us. So we had to grow organically. So with that $1,000, uh, we started using it to produce some few products. The first products we took to the market, it was rejected. The reason is because in Ghana, most people um, despise the techie berries locally called abedru. They despise it. So when they saw it in forms of the liha techie berry teas, jams, juices, and spreads, they could not connect. So it was difficult even generating revenue. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit the globe, that was where our business turned around. Because then everyone began to think about healthy nutrition. Everyone wanted to take something that could improve their health. Then they began to turn to our products. And then that really brought a boost in our revenues in terms of because um, when we started in a month, we sell just about 100 packs of this. But when the COVID-19 hit, we're able to sell about 5,000 of this in a month. So for us, that was a blessing in disguise. And that is how we grew. Now, it got to a point we needed um, funding to, you know, currently the farmers we are working with, we don't own the farmlands. Because when we asked for um, of a farmland, they told us in Ghana City is 20,000 Ghana City. That's like about um, $1,700. As a small business, we didn't have that amount of money to acquire the land. So we partnered with this smallholder women. They have the farmlands. And then we train them. We build their capacity. Then they grow the techie berries for us. Then we use it to feed our factory. That is how we are currently um, partnering with them. We have not still been able to acquire lands because of the costs. Then it got to a point we needed machinery because the demand was increasing. We needed to increase our production and productivity. We approached the banks for funding. They were not ready to help us. Then we joined an initiative called the Orange Corners Program, and they were ready to support us. But the loan came with an interest, and the interest wasn't favorable. But we had to go for it the hard way. So we used this loan to acquire um, two machines, even though we need about six machineries. And that is how far we've come. In the next five years, we are looking at raising a funding of about $1.6 million to increase acquired lands, agriculture inputs, and machinery, um, take advantage of the free continental trade agreements to penetrate markets like Nigeria, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, and Sierra Leone, where malnutrition issues are prevalent, and also take our products beyond the globe. Thank you. OK. Uh, personally, I started my business with my own savings. Being in the corporate space, I was able to put money aside during the course of the years and set up my business. Over time, as my family saw that I was serious and really bent on taking the path of agriculture, they were able to, initially I leased, so they were able to allocate a piece of land that I could use over the time, which was also leased. So that was how I got into it. Over time, with growth of my business, I've been able to reinvest into it. And currently, I am upskilling, upskilling myself as an entrepreneur through a program that I'm going through to better create a higher value, higher impact venture. So that is what I'm doing right now. And in the next five years, I'm looking to be an individual who is able to support capacity in my area to move across to various parts of East Africa that I have my eye on. So currently, that is what I'm looking forward to doing in the next five years, building capacity and advocating for youth in this space. Thanks. Thank you very much, Induta. Uh, uh, we'll take one more question, and then unfortunately, we have to wrap up. Oh, OK. Then I'm glad I'm the, <laughs> I'm the one to take. All right. My name is John Adwola. I'm the manager for Aco Agriculture Foundation. Uh, I have two questions, one for uh, Fatawu and one for Nduta, my very good friend. Uh, Fatawu, I wanted to say that you are doing an excellent work, and it's good to see success story like yours coming out. 
uh, but probably you didn't have enough time to explain. I would like to know uh, what are the key initiatives that you are doing for farmers with disabilities in your area? It would be good to know because why uh, it might be an area of interest to some institutions or organizations that support farmers focused solutions. And for us to really also know how do you navigate uh, challenges in times of uh, uh, access to finance. I know you, you mentioned it, but what are the things that you, you basically do with this group of farmers if you have this initiative to overcome them? And then to come to you, hy uh, I know I've been to your farm once in 2018, uh, and we, we harvested fish together. That was very nice. So but I wanted, you say you aggregate farmers, and then you, sometimes you take their produce to the markets. How do you, you didn't mention about the uh, post-harvest aspect, which I think is a very critical uh, discussion. What do you do in those situations where you've given farmers, these women farmers, a very big hope, we're going to sell your produce and then come back with big money and distribute for you. And then it doesn't happen when you get to the market. How do you deal with these post harvest losses? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, when it comes to disabled farmers, you know, you know we were there as persons with disability as an association, uh, but we weren't having the Disabled Farmers Union until we came up with the idea that some of the persons with disability are into farming and some uh, are in begging, street begging, and we have to erase the street begging issue on the, in the community. So what we did was we created, uh, we formed that group, Disabled Farmers Union, a union, then I became the advocate for that, that union. When I hear opportunity about an NGO supporting persons with uh, maybe youth or people on some aspects of uh, uh, agriculture, I run to them, explain our situation, they give us a quota as persons with disability. Because uh, GIZ gave us, uh, we heard that GIZ was giving beehives to some farmers and giving them training. So we had to go. They gave us some quota and we made those people to be trained. So. We're focused on those on begging. I went in, convinced them to come. They picked the, those he, beehives, went through the training, and now they are now processing the honey and selling, and they are surviving on it. Basically, that is what we do. Access to fun, uh, funding is always a problem. So we sometimes sit every Friday, we come together. We have uh, this thing, women in my community, they have uh, a container, they saving every week so when you want loan you take loan from there and come and pay the loan back and you'll be paying with interest so now we have that box every Friday we sit down everybody the money that is you are giving to uh, you are putting in the box at the end of the year is still your money so that by, if you want loan you come and take the loan but if it is getting closer to the time that we share the money among ourselves then you bring the money back but every month you'll be paying, while the money is still with you, you'll be paying interest. Every month you'll be paying interest as little as uh, 10 Ghana cities a month. That is what we do. Thank you. Uh, to answer your question on post harvest losses, John, currently we have a regenerative farm system that we practice in my area. So we are able to use the manure from the animals to feed into the farms, and the produce from the farms are able to also feed into the animal section of the business. So technically, we don't really have much losses coming from that. We, pre we focused when we go to the market, so we are able to know the requirements on production. We are optimizing our farm practices to make sure the quality is better and standardized, and we reduce the waste based on poor farming methods. So we're just reinventing our different ways of farming, integrating new systems and old systems to find a way to make it work better. So currently we are consuming what we have in the farm and minimal post-harvest losses. At times we even take uh, waste produce from fruit farmers in the market to regenerate it into farmers who are doing black soldier flies farming to add value to our animal feeds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Induta. So, and thank you very much.
for your questions. Even though we're not taking more questions, I would encourage you to talk to us after the panel. Now I think we can consider each other as friends. So please come up to us, talk to us, ask us your questions, and we'll be happy to engage in discussions with you. As we come to a close, we've heard from our youth speakers on how improved policy and private sector action can really expand and deepen their economic participation in the sector. We've also heard how enhanced coordination, meaningful engagement and partnerships with youth and amongst each other in terms of private sector actors, development actors, governments, can really contribute to creating transformation within the agri-food system to ensure that it's youth inclusive, it's equi equitable, and most importantly, a key source of income and economic um, participation for young people. At the MasterCard Foundation, we found that when young people are equipped with the skills and the support and the resources and incentives, they are highly motivated and in turn create transformative solutions. So as we conclude here, I'd like to challenge each of you. How can you actively support us young Africans in the sector? What immediate action are you going to take today to continue to carry us forward throughout the sector in the coming decades and so many more beyond us? Thank you so much again for your time this morning. And to close out in full youth fashion, I'd like to invite you all to gather around here for a quick selfie. Thank you so much again. Don't be shy, come up. <laughs>